Luke's research links digital life and political life and uses methods from communication studies and science and technology studies. And it's basically about the social study of information technologies and their use. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Luke to talk about misinformation. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very informative to myself about what I uh, get up to. So appreciate that introduction, Brad. That was uh, very well done. And I, I, I do want to say thank you for inviting me to have this chat. And yeah, I guess, I mean, I think I, I'll start by acknowledging that in Australia, when we when we do have these kinds of conversations, uh, we acknowledge that the land that, that we're having them on um, is not actually our own. It was never ceded um, by, by the people that our Western ancestors um, found. So I just do acknowledge that there's various ways that we can talk about the elders that are here, um, the elders of the past, and um, the ones that might be reaching out across uh, the Zoom call today. But we are in the Wadundri lands and uh, acknowledge that, yeah, this land was not ceded. So that being said, we're here to talk about misinformation. And I want to talk about misinformation in three parts. Um, focus on what it is, what it does, and then what to do about it. So um, that in mind, I actually had a really nice talk about a really nice bird watching community, a community that gathered both online and in person um, to spread the gospel that birds aren't real. Um, we can see here the founder, um, Peter McIndo, I believe is how it's pronounced, Peter McIndo. He is the founder of this subversive anti-anti-misinformation club. I'm sure you're all Googling it on a side uh, tab now. Um, here he's posing in character as the leader of Birds Aren't Real. Um, or I should say he's posing in a context of a world that has passed truth. Um, and by past truth, I mean it is moved past truth. We are in a space um, where there is a cacophony of truths that we need to deal with. And I was going to use this birds aren't real community as a kind of case study to explain how misinformation works, um, what it does, and of course, what we can do about it. And, um, and then things literally blew up. Um, I was asked to do this talk uh, a few weeks ago, and the world has definitely moved on in that time. So uh, we are going to focus on the Ukraine and the major misinformation campaigns that are occurring as a way to kind of explore this issue. So I will be having some examples that um, are quite current and probably not thought about um, to the best of our abilities and that they are just so raw, but we'll do what we can with them. I will um, start us off, though, by saying that while birds aren't real, and I, I believe that, we'll talk about that later, while birds aren't real, um, fake news is. Fake news is real. And I, I, I'm going to put up on the screen here one of the maybe our first examples. Um, but I'm going to say this is not actually fake news. This is a quite well known tabloid in North America and in the US, uh, particularly called the Weekly World of the News. And this is a front page from 1993. Hillary Clinton, when she was the spouse of President Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton adopts alien baby. Um, I'd argue this is not fake news. This is entertainment. This is parody, some may say. Um, but it's not very deceptive to very many. There's not uh, a chance that you will be misinformed by seeing this tabloid. Yes, it's understood to be something outside of what news possibly is. Fake news is more sinister than um, this kind of tabloid conspiracy or entertainment. And I thought this was a pretty good example of fake news that we could draw our attention to that came from the Russian embassy uh, in the UK, their Twitter account at least, <clears throat> excuse me, on the 10th of March. Now, uh, Twitter's taken these posts down for reasons we can, we can talk about. This is a nice little layered example of um, fake news happening potentially. And then on the right, we can see, um, that's actually the, the Russian account that's put in a big fake stamp and circled um, some things in red, red, red squiggles um, to say that, you know what, this wasn't actually a bombing. This wasn't actually a victim. It's actually a fashion blogger who's playing the role, right, et cetera, et cetera of um, an event that we have, we have seen play out on TV in the Russian, or, or on the internet, I suppose, in the Russian embassy saying this is actually fake news. But there's a few more layers to why this is fake news or why it's misinformation. And I'd like to just explore those, but hey, I'm far, starting by def thinking about how we can define what misinformation or disinformation is. <clears throat> First of all, the 
to differentiate between misinformation and disinformation, usually what's uh, usually the differentiator there is intent, right? Knowing that you're communicating things that are not accurate is disinformation, um, whereas spreading misinformation, who knows, right? You're just spreading something that may be true. This distinction really blurs blurs sorry in the digital in the digital space really blurs in social media it blends um, in the online space in ways that make it a bit moot and we'll talk about that as we go along but here if you've been reading the slide are three different kind of frames that we can understand misinformation or disinformation the first is quite quite state based okay the first is quite state based meaning this is how um, different states the international system of nation states would look at things this is taken from thomas ridd who wrote a book called active measures in 2020 right up front right he says uh misinformation and disinformation are um communications that exasperate existing tensions and contradictions within an adversaries body politic within the public of an adversary by leveraging facts, fakes, and ideally a disorienting mix of both. And I want you to just remember that, that disorienting mix of both, right, to get to our misinformation. Um, if we just kind of move down the line there, away from maybe state concerns to more a political economic look at things, right, when we're concerned about power inequalities and structural power, um, then we see false, you know, false information um, being driven either by agendas of power and racism, right, if you think about those types of structures, or instead driven by mistrust deriving from ongoing social and economic e exclusion. So Jay Zwall et al. defined misinformation. This was actually taken from something uh, where they looked at COVID misinformation. They're trying to understand misinformation being derived from ongoing social and economic exclusion or the structures that differentiate the power um, powerful from the powerless, right? And those feelings of exclusion lead to different types of uh, narratives that are, in fact, misinformed. Finally, um, Zuckerman and McQuaid, a couple of years ago now, offer a concept they call the unreal. They try to move past fake news, misinformation, all of these types of terms, active measures, um, psyops, whatever you want to call it, and say they start talking about the unreal. And they talk about uh, approach to politics, and politics is very uh, kind of like cultural politics, big tent politics here, meaning just how uh, we come to live our lives and the power people have to do so. Approach to politics that forsakes interpretation of a common set of facts in favor of creating closed universes of mutually reinforcing facts and interpretations. Um, their claim is that ignorance uh, is consciously created in the unreal. There is a almost a, a joy or a vervre of creating this closeted ignorance, where we have a closed universe that reinvert, sorry, that reinforces our own interpretations of how um, the world works. So there's just kind of three different levels about how to think about misinformation. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to just bring us back to the leveraging facts, fakes, and ideally a disorienting mix of both, um, because it can shed a little bit more light on our misinformation here um, from the Russian embassy. Now, what's interesting to me is what I've highlighted in red here is um, both of these pieces of content, right, where, where we call them active measures or otherwise misinformation, um, actually reference something that it seems the pictures and the story isn't about, right? And this is this Azov Battalion, the Azov Battalion. Um, and this is a really important or interesting piece of information that the Russian um, communication systems have been putting into um, the public sphere. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, we saw this actually in, in Australia, um, just, I guess, uh, sorry, sorry, a little more than last week, um, a few weeks ago now. Australia has a very prominent, popular um, TV program called q &A. It's basically a public affairs program that invites members of the public um, to ask notable people around what they think of the issue of the day, right? It's question and answer format, at least part of it. Um, in the first week of March, there was a guest who, a member of the public, the Australian public, a uh, grad student from the University of Melbourne, I believe, who asked a question that was deemed to be pro-Russian, 
that was deemed to be pro-Russian, and he was asked to, actually asked to leave the program. The host um, had enough said it was something that was bothering him about the way this question was asked, and um, and asked him to leave. He was kicked off, which was, I, I think, a first for Q and A. What was interesting was the response um, to me, the response that uh, Sasha. Um, put forward on his own social media page as you do these days. I'll just let you read it. But interestingly, we say, you know, we can take from it this. Look, I, uh, I made a question. It was vetted by your producers. I was vetted again. Everyone knew what I was going to say. And all I did was add seven words where I referenced again this Azov Battalion, this Azov Battalion. So here you can start seeing a theme um, between things that are real and aren't real. And I'm not saying what the Azov Battalion is because you're going to go look it up and be marked in various ways by the internet. Um, but it, it, you can see a theme of how misinformation connects various truths, fakes, um, and, and real facts around what's going on to try to create its own narrative and sway what we think about a certain situation, what we are in fact thinking about. We have a really interesting example from the past. This is taken from Thomas Ridd. Um, and in the throes of the Cold War, there was a moment when um, there was a large push for no new US missiles in Europe. And peace loving um, hippies and the rest of them started pushing this message out, no US missiles in Europe. What Rid claims, and I think is quite interesting, here we have uh, Rid's, there's a picture of a button that's worn by you know, protesters, and then uh, the Smithsonian and Google actually came together to put some of, put some of these um, cultural artifacts and display online. Um, so that's what's on, what's on your left. You can see the messaging is very similar. Um, anyways, <clears throat> the point is many anti-war protesters, people who were against nuclear weapons, full stop, um, took on this messaging, no to new US missiles in Europe. What Ridd finds interesting is that he claims, and I think there's some good evidence towards this claim, he claims that the phrasing of this, no new US missiles in Europe, uh, was actually created at its, at its start by um, the, the KGB, the special, the, the, their, their, um, active, their active measures group there. And what's interesting is that in the context um, is the claim is that, you know what, there were a bunch of nuclear missiles in Europe on the USSR side, and the United States was reacting by saying, okay, well, then we'll put our missiles on our side. And what we see from this phraseology is um, that it equates no war, peace, right, with the actual position of the Soviet Union. We would not like new US missiles in Europe, please. The missiles we have there, the nukes that are there, are just fine, thank you. That's the unsaid um, effect of this misinformation campaign. What's really interesting, though, to me is the blend between fact and the misinformed gets really tricky. Um, the case officers who are working both on the KGB side and the CIA side, right, um, around this campaign, thinking about what was going on, could not tell if the activists wanting no new missiles in Europe um, were active agents of the Soviets, or this was actually just now organic um, protest around nuclear weapons. But because the phrasing was done in such a way and seeded in such a way, it was actually working for, the claim goes, the Soviets over the US. So this blend between fact and, and misinformed information gets really tricky and shows the power of how misinformation works, whether um, it's someone like poor Sasha, right? Um, or we have our historical example. And I'd like to kind of just now roll back and say, you know, if this is the historical example, um, we live in a space now where these kind of active measures, so the misinformation that is state-based um, combines in a really interesting way with the incredibly connected communities that we live in online, um, i.e. that, you know, we live online now, and this is where the, our community sits for a lot of, uh, a lot of intensive purposes. And this idea of the ambivalent internet, internet. Um, ambivalent internet is really a phrase that comes up from people who study the lulls, um, the weirdness of the internet, the quirkiness, and the ways that people come together to make their own communities for the fun of it. And when we combine these three kind of 
these three kind of Venn I guess, into a Venn diagram, we see that the misinformation that is produced um, nowadays is potentially unlike misinformation we've, we've had before and definitely more complex as we try to unravel it. And I have an example about how complex these things can get. Um, <clears throat> this is a couple screen grabs from Redfish, which is not a Russian state controlled media, but is editorially independent and is objective, but not neutral. Um, Redfish is, I guess, an update to the previous uh, no new missiles idea. Um, so this is how they describe themselves, right? Not Russian controlled. Um, Facebook and other media conglomerates uh, state that Redfish is, in fact, Russian state controlled media. And the answer is, is actually really unclear. Uh, I say that Redfish is an update to this previous idea of no new missiles because Redfish is a media organization that covers real issues and they have a very antagonistic far left of things. They're very close to social justice movements and the kind of, um, yeah, social justice movements that exist right now across the states and in other parts of the world. And they also happen to be run in part um, by former Russian information officers. And this is according to Charles Davis, who of the Daily Beast, who is reporting back in 2018. Um, so on the one hand, you know, Redfish is a subversive news organization that fights against the kind of empire or imperial overreach of the West. Um, but it was also bred with very statist Russian state interests, literally the people that used to run information operations um, for the Russian state in various countries. Um, so I think it's interesting that we think about this, and I have I have um, the map that kind of made Redfish famous in the last few weeks. This was a map that came out um, February 24th. So the idea was, right, that look, um, you know, yes, there's bombings occurring in Ukraine, but in the last 48 hours, there's also Israeli airstrikes in Damascus, and the Saudis struck Yemen, Yemen and um, the U.S. struck Somalia, right? Um, this is a this is a, a, a rhetorical technique, whataboutism, that says, yeah, well, what about all these other horrible things that you need to think about? It's not just the Russians doing this. And while that you know could be a very valid sentiment, and it is valid information, it's precise or accurate, right? That map could be very accurate. It's also very useful um, for Russian interests to drop this map the same morning that you start dropping bombs in the Ukraine. Yeah, so we can just see again how this misinformation works in the kind of diagram we have um, where there's a lot of actors doing a lot of different things. Now, interesting to me, right, we've kind of gone through, um, this is Russian state controlled media, or it's not. Uh, interestingly, three of my friends, right, have liked Redfish Media. I just took this straight off the, straight off the, um, the feed. And uh, yeah, I was, I, I, won't, I won't say who, who they are, or whether they're, you know, uh, working for a, a state or not, but I thought that was interesting that this, this to some extent does work. Now, um, we have a, just one last example, um, just around the ambiguity and how misinformation can kind of work in that blend between information, the facts, and, uh, and the fakes. Um, do we remember Edward Snowden's disclosures a few years ago around how the NSA um, has a massive spying operation and, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? Um, do we remember a story around Angela Merkel that related to Snowden? And I think we've turned our, our mics off, but if anyone wants to put their hand up, um, Luke Wattsford, do you want to try to recall that story for us? I think you be, might be able to unmute as you have um, powers of authority in this call. I just got to write a vague recollection of <clears throat> just the fact that the allies were spying on her and keeping a dossier or something like that. And because we're supposed to be allies and friends, it wasn't something that we wanted. That's or, right. That's, or some kind of perception there. That's right. So that's perfect. Vague recollection um, around, I mean, my, my recollection of it is that uh, the NSA or someone in America anyways, was um, spying on Angela Merkel um, through her phone, right? Listening to her phone or seeing who she called, but it was her phone, it was this thing about her phone. And it came up through the Guardian reported it, and I think their Spiegel as well, around the same time that the Snowden documents were all coming out. 
it bleeds into the um, story about the um, Israeli uh, soft, a company which then put software to feed into others. So it's part of a continuing story in a sense of tapping people's phones and, and um, compromising both your friends and your enemies. That's right. And what's, what was interesting for me in the misinformation space um, was that that story, this piece of that story, so that narrative is well known, right? This piece of that story, um, it was never clear that it came from Snowden when the garden was reporting it. It was never clear that they said, a lot of the other Snowden material, they said, we know this based on these documents. It was never clear that it came from Snowden. Snowden never said anything about it. There was assumptions that there was actually, at the time that there might be another leaker, someone else who was giving documents to um, newspapers so that they could report on these things. The other way to look at it, of course, is that within all the facts that Snowden was revealing were some falsehoods that were inserted, right? By someone who would want to, and if we remember, our definitions, oh, sorry, if we remember our definitions, someone who would want to exasperate existing tensions and contradictions within an adversary's public, or in this case, sets of governments by leveraging facts, fakes, and ideally a disorienting mix of both, right? So we can see here the implication being that that story might've been a piece of misinformation. We don't know, we don't know yet. Um, the piece, the piece around Snowden, though, does kind of bring to light that cryptography, right, and anonymity in the internet um, are not making discerning misinformation easier. It's a lot harder. There's been great strides in radical transparency. All this kind of information wants to be free, et cetera, right? The ideology around that. But it's also bonanza for misinformation, where you can put up facts or fakes, give them to WikiLeaks, and see what happens. And again, if we think about what the Merkel story accomplished, then we can start to see right um, what it what it was. Speaking in just one last example, and this is this is I think from uh, oh this this was a couple days ago, but um, so here's so okay so here's uh, 13 hours ago. Just yesterday, I wanted to bring up this idea of exasperating tensions and contradictions within within an adversary and and at adversary, sorry, body politic, adversaries, body politic. Um, here we go. On the 11th of March, we have uh, the Ministry of Defense for Russia talking about biolabs, right? The military biological activities of the US in the Ukraine and um, starting to spin this story up. Yesterday, um, we see Tulsi Gabbard, who was, um, I mean, not a politician of note, other than to say that in America she ran for, uh, she was a presidential candidate for a while, um, starting to really um, exhibit tensions and contradictions, right, between her and another prominent politician over the story around biolabs. So here we can see this misinformation around biolabs um, having its intended effect. And interestingly, if we catch it, catch this, just see where, where it's coming from, um, from my, from my quick search, right? Um, this is actually the, this is actually the first, um, mention in the, in the kind of far right blogs and, and information space around US biolabs. This is a, a Twitter account called war clandestine. It's now gone, been removed by Twitter, but on February 24th, we have this map. We have some speculation around why the US installed biolabs. Um, to the right, we have some truth seekers, if you will, or fact checkers um, trying to figure out when this biolab story came to be. And here's a striking chart from a company that tracks uh, biolabs on 15 influential far right social networks, right? Um, and we see that they jump on the 24th, the day of invasion into Ukraine. Yeah, uh, what's interesting about the biolab story, right, is that like it was already percolating, I had it in this slide here, uh, that the US tried to set this record straight around the biolabs. And this is, you know, uh, this is, this is um, biosurveillance of pathogens in, um, not pathogens, sure, and also just other, uh, you know, naturally occurring uh, pathogens in, in Ukraine, in, uh, yeah, for the, for the animals there, right, that the US helped set up. And the U.S. explains this 
um, the biological threats that exist, right? The surveillance we try to do, lest there be a pandemic or something. <clears throat> and they tried to set this record straight in 2020. So again, facts, fiction, fakes, um, all coming together in really interesting ways. That's what I want us to take away from what this information is, um, how it works, right? How it kind of builds. I should point out, I'm putting this slant on it um, because this isn't the first time the kind of uh, a explicit Russian, Russian disinformation campaign um, thought about how the US was using animals and their migratory patterns to spread biological weapons. There are similar stories told in the 80s uh, by, by Russian mis misinformation campaigns that were quite colorful in their descriptions um, around killer mosquitoes and how um, the US was using you know, cattle migration through, Afghan through Pakistan and through Af Afghanistan um, to, to actually hinder their, the war efforts, the USSR, the USSR's war efforts in the 1980s. So this is an old, an old trope that comes up again and again and again, uh, but is you know, effective enough. Now, I would talked about what it is a little bit there. I'd like now to just shift to what it does. And I think that Zuckerman and McQuaid, when they're talking about uh, the unreal, really do hit an important point. Um, and I think we'll, we'll start there. They actually bring out RT, and I'm really banging on Russia, um, but I think, it's, I think it's valid to do so in, in the moment. Um, we'll see how it comes back to haunt us, but I will continue with it. So Zuckerman and McQuaid in their 2019 um, article around, around the unreal, I actually use RT, Russia Today, as an example. They say RT's slogan is, is question more, right? Question more. But it also, the slogan actually reveals the logic behind it. The goal is not to persuade American viewers or any other viewers um, in any specific conspiracy theory, but instead to persuade viewers that they should question any narrative that they've been, any, ever encountered, any narrative that they've ever encountered. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that, um, misinformation does. And I'd actually like to talk about two, but I just thought I'd, I'd start with that example. So the first thing, right, the first is this idea of continual doubt and its effects on society. What happens when you have to question every single thing, um, any narrative that you've previously encountered? The second is acknowledging maybe a more productive use of misinformation. It's acknowledging that misinformation is not only for foreign adversaries, it's not only for foreign adversaries. It actually makes up the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves to shape our own narratives of identity, uh, sometimes explicitly as a national myth, sometimes uh, expressed differently. So I'm going to talk about both those things, this kind of continual doubt and uh, acknowledging that it is, can also be, I should say, stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. So on the doubt, on the continual doubt, when you have this continual questioning of any narrative you've previously encountered. Oops, there we are. Um, it results in this worldview, and I think um, this says it. This says it more eloquently than I ever can. Where you have this world worldview, where all information is just manipulation. If you're questioning everything, this is a worldview where all the values, ideals, ideas are mere fronts to subvert the other side, the other right. There's no qualitative difference between independent journalism and covert social media information operations, psyops, whatever it is you want to call it. And um, the idea is this is really kind of the information more catch-22. On the one hand, we need to expose covert information, right? The information operations, what is misinformation, without starting to see information itself is something inherently dangerous, right? Um, we have to kind of avoid this underlying criticism, cynicism and conspiracy thinking around what information itself is, how it can be used. Otherwise, um, we, we foster this continual doubt that really does wreck the foundations of a cohesive society, something that's able to come together. At the same time, what is happening? Misinformation is stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. That quote, stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. I was taken from Clifford Geertz. He's an anthropologist, um, an ethnographer, if you will, right? Who writes about people, their experience, their lived lives. And I borrow that, borrow that quote here um, to point out that facts 
don't inform my, our identity as much as stories do. Okay? Facts don't inform our identity as much as stories do. The narrative of who you are is much more important to you than facts about you, your age, your height, your BMI, your nationality, right? Um, what your passport says your sex or gender is. It's your narrative that actually creates who you are. Um, we can see this materialized in this, the, what I put up on the slide right now. Um, to the right, we have a screenshot. I snapped it on my own iPhone from RT, um, selling the Z or Z shirt. I wish I had the date on this, but it was very, very soon after the 24th that I grabbed that screenshot. So you can already see the kind of cultural referencing, the narrative of what it means to be Russian in a state-based form, um, in a state-based broadcaster as tanks and other um, military vehicles are rumbling through Ukraine, we'll see painted on their sides. On the other side, uh, we see birds aren't real merchandise. And we see that there is a productive uh, concentration of community that comes together that says, I identify with this thing that I'm calling birds aren't real. And I haven't gotten into what that is yet, but I identify with this cult or joke or in-group or experimentation around truth um, that birds aren't real. But anyways, it uh, exists here in material form. And I will talk about uh, birds aren't real later if we have time, we'll see. Um, just along the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, there's some really interesting reporting by uh, Thompson and Alba from the New York Times a couple of weeks ago that looked around fact and myth-making, how fact and myth-making blend. Uh, that was the title of their thing in UK, Ukraine's information war. They had the example of the ghost of Ukraine, which was a myth set up by the Ukrainian government about um, an ace who'd shot down all these Russian pilots, right? Um, interestingly, what I took out from the reporting, right, is we have actually responses within Twitter to the ghost of Kiev saying, why can't we just let people believe some things, right? If the Russians believe it, well, it'll bring them fear. And if we, the Ukrainians, believe it, it brings us hope, right? It brings us together. Uh, and that's a certain aspect of what information, uh, sorry, misinformation does and how it forms community, right? It is a, it is a way uh, not only to question and break communities apart, but is also a way to form them, form them in new ways. And when we live in the digital, um, a, a digital society where we're often online and form our community uh, ties there, misinformation can play a very big role. And there's other, there's other kind of examples of this, right? It's not just a fictitious, um, a fi a, a fictitious um, fighter pilot, right? Um, the point that misinformation um, narrativizes something better than facts is really powerful. Um, some people call it public affairs, right? Um, Canada, where I'm from, did a very good job, I think, of telling a story about its national multiculturalism, a nationalism built on multiculturalism, um, which helped it deal with the immigration that actually needed to build a nation in, in the sense that it did um, a couple a generation ago now. Australia, I found, doesn't quite tell that story the same way. I'm not saying it's unfactual. I'm saying it's presented in a way that tells a story about ourselves um, in a very specific way. Another Australian example, we can think of Anzac Day here, a holiday that narrativizes a very specific national myth in a very specific way. Uh, we can't even question what um, those facts are, what they mean to our country, right? Um, it's, it's ingrained in the way we talk about it in our identity. So if that's what's happening, if that's what misinformation does, what do we do about it? On the one hand, um, this continual doubt uh, pulls out the foundation of a cohesive society, right? And on the other hand, these narratives actually build, allow the building of identity, right? Not in an overly deceptive way against others even, but in a productive way to craft truth through story rather than just report the facts. Um, this is what journalists do when they make the news. Um, journalists have facts and then they create stories. And we can, we can debate about that if we wish. Anyways, what are we to do about it? How do we close the book, on the other hand, in other words, on misinformation? Um, and you might, you know, this Facebook might take umbrage of the, of the font there, um, but the facts are this, right? Social media 
are designed to spread misinformation. And fixing this requires working against the tide. What do I mean by this? I mean the design of how social media um, actually create your newsfeed, create your stories, um, are designed to actually spread those things that misinform. That's not a secret. If we look back to the reporting of Hegley and Jeff Horowitz uh, back in 2021 around Facebook, we get some really in-depth understandings around how Facebook works by assigning points to certain indicators of engagement, okay? Um, they call it meaning social interaction. And the idea here is if someone um, posts something that is divisive, that makes someone angry, that causes a large reaction, that will actually spread more, yeah, than something that is less divisive. That's how their system works, so that you engage with their system more because they want you to see ads or whatever. Um, this isn't a secret. We see that, so uh, Jeff, Hor Jeff Horowitz and uh, Hegley made their news story on, they called it the outrage algorithm that basically just shows how Facebook spreads outrage, right? It's designed to actually spread information um, that is that can be unfactual and that will spread further than stuff that is, i.e. because it's less, less divisive, right? People not saying, well, that's completely untrue. How can you believe that? Anyways, um, this wasn't news to a former Facebook programmer, right? But said, look, it's not basically, I read this as saying, it's not just Facebook. Um, increasing feed engagement will invariably amplify misinfo, sensationalism, hate, and other societal harms. I wish this weren't the case, but it is so predictable that it is perhaps a natural law of social networks. And I think he's using social networks in a larger sense here, but we can see um, how digital social networks amplify this problem. And this is the day, I mean, I think it was cute. This is the day after Horowitz dropped his kind of bomb around how Facebook works to spread um, outrage and its polarly misinformation. But, um, well, it's not a secret, neither is there a simple fix, right? So here's Jeff Horowitz, the guy who actually wrote that story, retweeting just a couple days ago, look, maybe Maybe it's not a great idea to just take YouTube out of Russia. Maybe it's not a great idea to take these platforms out of an information space that is very contested, um, right? As pointed out in recent years, things like YouTube have enabled a truly diverse range of voices in the country to gain audiences, uh, rivaling state TV. So thinking about these kind of trends, <clears throat> What can, what can we actually do? What can communities do, uh, both online and off, when just offering truthful information isn't enough? And I think I'd like to end with just a few points um, to talk about maybe what we can think about doing and how we can think managing this. And then uh, we'll either go to Q&A or we can, we can look at um, what bird, the Birds Aren't Real community uh, is doing, but we can look at that a little bit later uh, as well. Another time, that's what I mean. So, um, number one, I think there is an interesting development in um, 2022 anyways, about snuffing out, right? Um, misinformation in real time. There are real time communities of fact ninjas is what I'm calling them, not fact checkers so much that come in after the fact, but fact ninjas that snuff out misinformation before it spreads, right? They are on the look for it. This is an open source community of hackers and Ukrainians and people who just want to, right? This is, this, this is that ambivalent, ambivalent internet, the weirdos out there that are making communities for their own sakes um, that destroy misinformation campaigns before they can gather steam. Once they've gathered steam, they've done their, you know, they've, they've done their damage and they can be refuted, but it doesn't matter anymore. Um, but by basically being half a step ahead, right, of the misinformation campaigns, it seems to be somewhat effective in the opening couple of weeks of this, of, uh, of what we've seen in Ukraine and Russia anyways. The second is actually um, stepping away from the content, map it. So there's some work <clears throat> by Ashford et al that's just come out um, earlier this year um, that talks about looking at the shape of social networks, how, i.e. like a social network analysis of how 
pieces of information are shared. And you can actually see kind of suspicious patterns, right, of how stories grow. Um, so you don't actually, and this is, this, is, this is very useful because you don't have to, for, for the platforms, because you don't have to do a content analysis, right? It's not so useful for you and I, but for the platforms, it's very useful. You don't have to do content analysis. Um, you can look at a certain pattern of sharing and say something's going on here. We need to turn the sharing of this down. In the same way, if you know its divisiveness or its anger reactions go up, that's what they use to engage people and make something spread more. They now say, okay, looking at this pattern, we should actually turn the sharing of this down. Let it spread less. Yeah? Soft censorship, if you want to call it that, but it is a choice. Um, <clears throat> some other interesting research that we see come up in various in, in various studies from time to time, but I'm saying is degrade degrade misinformation degrade misinformation's playing field. There's these kind of cognitive biases we all have. And if you actually ask someone, do you think this is accurate before they share it? They're a lot less likely to share things that are less accurate. If they just share it because they're outraged, click share because, you know, um, Hillary Clinton gave up her baby, you know, <laughs> her, her um, alien baby. If, if we just hit share to that, then you just share it. But if there's this pause, the speed bump that says, um, do you think this is accurate? Yes, no. People will actually share that non-accurate information a lot less. So that's another way to slow this down, right? Stop the campaign in its tracks. And by campaign, I just, I mean that in the general sense. Um, Joan Donovan, who is an excellent misinformation researcher, and I would suggest anyone who's interested in, in misinformation, follow, um, learn, and read um, about Joan Donovan. She's, uh, she's in Boston at Harvard, among other places. She talks about um, regulating or re-regulating our information utilities. Then the, the basic argument is that Facebook and others, um, other platforms have become public utilities, public information utilities, and therefore uh, need to provide important information and updates. And to a shout out to our librarians, um, this is this is Joan saying truth in this just in this point point truth needs an advocate uh, and it should come in the form of, of enormous flock of librarians descending on Silicon Valley to create the Internet we deserve an information ecosystem that serves the people and I thought this was great um, shout out to the librarians what what we can do how we can think about the kind of stories right, the narratives that we choose um, to exist and where they are, right? How would a librarian be employed at Facebook? What kind of skills does that bring to something that otherwise uses divisive information to create engagement? Yeah, so anyways, that's uh, Donovan's, Donovan's call out, which I thought was great in the re-regulation of information utilities. Um, Another one we need to think about, I think, is managing management of communities, right? Communities we live with are online now, and we all um, form, in, or I should say, sorry, our communities in part are, in, at least in part, are formed online, whether we like it or not, especially in the last couple of years with the pandemic. So um, community management, right? The management of online communities has turned into a big business. It's turned into, um, you know, a, a uh, integral piece, some flashy industry, if you will, in the last few years. And we need to think about what that looks like um, in, in, better, in better light. Chinese platform governance, this is to say how platforms in China are managed by a lot of little editors, is a really interesting model. And I've kind of switched the, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristic or whatever, right, uh, for Chinese platform characteristics platform governance with Western characteristics. What would this look like? What would that kind of active management look like when we think about um, the health of a community and what misinformation can and can't do to it in terms of disintegrating the, that cohesiveness and also building up stories um, that we tell ourselves about ourselves, yeah? And finally, last word, we'll go to Dana Boyd and, uh, and Donovan again, that, said, that say, they say, you know what, at the end of the day, it's a normative choice. They suggest um, drawing on a kind of history of strategic silence, meaning knowing when to speak about things that are going and when not. To argue for a new type of editorial approach they call strategic amplification, that I read is boiling down to having agency about reporting uh, what it is we should report in our news feeds. 
in our news programs and within ourselves, uh, within our communities uh, more wholeheartedly in, in terms of just the personal networks that we have, right? Thinking before sharing, um, in other words. Now, um, so that's really I just saw how I wanted to, to end off by giving those potential fronts around misinformation. Um, <clears throat> I will end off, end off, end off though, um, with this claim that was just from four days ago now to kind of bring us full circle that um, while birds aren't real, and we know this, whoops, um, the, some of the latest claims around, around the bio labs, of course, is that, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. You can go look up uh, David Gilbert's uh, piece of advice from a few days ago around how he's interpreted uh, the, the Ministry of Defense from Russia's uh, work. So anyways, I think I'll stop there just looking at time. Um, there's lots to talk about um, in terms of birds aren't real. There's a lot of information you can find in resources like this, the misinformation review, media manipulation work that um, Donovan has done. And Vice actually surprisingly is, has some really interesting kind of work there um, as well. So thank you all very much for uh, listening to my thoughts on misinformation. I hope it wasn't too off the cuff as I, as I really struggled to keep up with the misinformation that was happening in the, in the week um, that we've seen and, and at a pace that is, uh, I think, I, I think quite interesting in terms of the history to it. So I will stop my sharing there. And um, for, for my students at ALC 702, um, I think we'll focus a little bit more on the birds aren't real um, in our upcoming um, considerations of how to uh, study and make sense of online communities. So I'll give that shout out as I can and say thanks very much. Thanks very much, Luke. That was fascinating. Uh, if everyone wants to put their virtual hands together or the videos and put their physical hands together for Luke, um, we do have a few questions from a Mentimeter poll, Luke. Um, Simone's going to share her screen and put them up there. Would you like to answer some of those, please? That sounds great. Thank you. I'll just wait for the share. All right. This might talk about a news feed. This might be a little hard to scroll through. Um, how about that one? All right. How about that one? Sure. In an ambivalent communication network and the need to connect communities, how do we make citizens active and critical in their relationship to information? Um, I think that's a, a fantastic question. And it is, I think it does speak to that catch 22 in that we do need to be critical, but we can't be unbelievers in information in itself. Um, right? I mean, I think that that's how I read that kind of that really tricky space. So how do we make citizens active and critical? From a citizen standpoint, I think there's a few, a few ways we can go. Um, as, I've, as I've claimed, social media has certain designs, um, certain designs around how they're monetized, right? Um, and, and what, our, what our attention to them, um, how our attention to them is manipulated. And again, this isn't conspiratorial, this is just their business model. And I think we need to be very aware of that. Um, so I think an active citizen um, would not participate within that machine. They would be less of a cog within that machine. Um, to put this on the personal example, I, have not looked at my Facebook feed in years. Yeah, and, and that is an active choice um, that, that, that I make that hurts me in terms of the community I miss out on because I don't get to see my uncle's birthday and my cousin's baby pictures and the rest of it. But I also don't get pushed in ways that try to keep my attention focused that are actually destructive to my mental health and my community's health. So that would be one active way. Um, I think that kind of relationship to information, i.e. how much, how much and when and how you choose to ingest it, consume it and produce it um, is key. And platforms have a lot of power there. So considering which platforms and why and for what you use, I think is key. Maybe I'll answer that question that way. Um, so the floods. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, so just the floods caused by a government weather engineering a machine. 
um, you know, that if, if only, right, that would solve climate change pretty quick. Um, so, I mean, there's the absurdity to it, but are we gonna see these conspiracies undermine climate science? I don't think so much they undermine them as take attention and energy away from where it can go, right? So we're not gonna undermine, um, the great example is AIDS, believe it or not, right? Um, and the misinformation that, you know, the conspiracy theory that AIDS was a uh, disease that was created by the US, um, da, 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 da. and this came out in the 80s, and you can see, and you can look up the, the narrative of that, and where that information, where that misinformation came from. All the energy that went into not only trying to stop that idea, right, that narrative, but actually just those people that engage with that narrative is a lot of wasted energy and information about a real problem. And this is, this is the same thing we see, I think, with the climate change thing. So it's not so much undermine, but just waste the energy. The, the people with power don't believe um, that, but everyone else has to deal with the kind of ramifications. I hope that answered the question a little bit. Um, so what can we do to deal with misinformation? I think I've tried to answer that a little bit. Um, do you think different disciplinaries in the university need core similar learning experiences, information context? This is a pedagogical question. Um, or do they need to be contextualized for overall, uh, or do they need to be contextualized to overall learning for? Do, so I take this question, I mean, do we need like a central misinformation unit? Um, or um, do, is, it, is it kind of spread out? Is that the question? I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's probably nothing wrong with that. The same that there's nothing wrong with um, an academic integrity unit, right? Um, maybe we call it an information integrity unit. And we decide that, you know, as academics, we consume information and create information in various guises, right? Whether it's for assignment or sharing pictures with your mom on Facebook. Um, and the same kind of ethical consideration should come up for all of it. So maybe there's some expansion to academic integrity to answer that one. Any other burning questions? How do populations in authoritative states fight misinformation propaganda when true information um, is suppressed by the government? That's a that's a tough one, and we see it. We've seen that this week with someone holding up a sign right on a national broadcast in Russia. Um, we see it through various technological um, attempts. Right, there's not technology is not a solution for everything. Um, but we do see, you know, various various um, ways to get around structures and systems that exist. And we think about, um, you know, the the middle definition of misinformation, where it's those people in power, right? There's a structure of power, and those people in power are either using their power to produce information that keeps other people down. Um, that that is a real structural thing. So it's finding ways to get around that structure tactically. Um, We've, we've seen a lot of, I'll say, algorithmic oppression in the last five or 10 years, right? Where algorithms control us. I think um, something that is just coming to the fore is a kind of tactical use of algorithms to actually push back. Algorithms is tactical media to actually impress a new set of political possibilities. Um, we see things like uh, forensic architecture. You can look up forensic architectures doing that um, in a really interesting way. And uh, I have some research coming out on that in the next, uh, next couple of months. So uh, I don't know, follow me if you'd like to see, see more, I guess. Um, on teaching more broadly in the evaluative space. Sorry, so what does that question mean? Um, strong focus on this disinformation sphere. What are your thoughts on teaching more broadly in the evaluative space? What do you mean, I guess, what do you mean more broadly in the evaluative space? Oh, um, oh, sure, like kind of just teaching about these things like p-hacking and, um, deep, and, and deep fakes and all that kind of stuff. Is that the question? Sure. Not sure who put the question up. Does anyone yeah. want to elaborate? I, if someone wants to elaborate, please do. I'm not. Maybe we can take the um, the auto mute off just so people can unmute themselves. I. I mean, I think that's a really. I think that's a really interesting, um, a really interesting way to go. And I mean, what what better way to make you know again our our meaning in academics in general, not just Deacon, but our academic integrity unit, a little bit more interesting, right? Than throwing in some some. Um, 
deep fakes and like, you know, asking, asking students, okay, here, you know, here's getting students to create the deep fake and doing so um, in a way that we feel has uh, integrity. That's an interesting problem, right? Um, P hacking, the rest of it, like, why not? Yeah, I think that should definitely, definitely be a set of skills we have to be able to judge science in the big in the big term um, in critical perspectives and start that from the beginning um, as a you know as as part of as as something before you even get into methods right so we have that critical outlook. If anyone else has a burning question and they want to just put it into the chat, I'd be happy um, to answer it there. Question about how successful misinformation is in creating division. Um, there's there's various accounts, right? So you talk to some some people and say very. You talk to others and say it's actually overblown in terms of what people think is happening. Um, you know, I like the argument that says like because we're talking about it, it's it's working in the sense that we shouldn't be talking about it. We should be talking about climate change or you know what, whatever whatever our issue is, right? And we're not. We're talking about whether our issue is real or not. Our bird's real, and that's and that's kind of the point. So to that extent, it's I, I think quite um, it's quite successful. Yeah, so the fake news awareness can lead to, you know, the paralysis of evaluation. I think that's that catch 22, right? And it is, it is really tough. Um, there was a question around, you know, balancing, um, there it is, freedom, speed, and creativity around cohesion. I mean, I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Um, I've talked, you know, I talked about speed bumps, right? And kind of slowing it down. Um, off the cuff, the remark is that when it gets, when it gets ahead of us, um, the humans, right? So we have a machine human interface, we communicate via machines. Um, when it gets ahead of us, that's probably when that balance um, we can start thinking about, right? When I'm not quite sure why my Facebook feed has this or doesn't have this in it, when these things are being reported or aren't, that's probably, uh, that's probably an indicator that we might want to um, rethink that balance. What learning and teaching role do universities have in a strategic amplification approach? Um, so I think that's a great question. There's a journalist scholar, Jay Rosen, who, who answers this question for journalist colleagues um, and, and in terms of strategic amplification saying, you know, um, his answer for that is, is balance isn't 50-50, right? Objectivity isn't 50-50. Um, the world is flat. The world is not flat. Let's have two people debate it out for... 50-50. I think for then the university teaching context, there's there's a similar logic there, obviously, around our curriculum that we get to design. I mean, journalists have it harder because they are tasked with reporting the news, right? And we are tasked with creating a curriculum. So, I mean, I think we have it easier there. Um, but in terms of strategic amplitude, Amplification. I will say, I mean, one thing, one thing that we've seen in the information space in the last couple of weeks, as thing is just disappearing, and I don't think that's the way to do it. So the um, Russian embassy Twitter account, right? Boom, gone. Um, you know, climate denialism, boom, gone from from our curriculum. So I'm not quite sure that's the way to do it for a couple of reasons. One is you don't want to be perceived as biased or actually biased for reasons that you can't explain, right? You want to explain and be able to um, have your students understand where your biases come from, fact, logic, yeah, as opposed to just not talk about it. Um, but two, it, there's, a, there's a historical aspect to this, right? We need to actually track this so we can make sense of it later. Um, so we can see what those stories are actually about, right? Why are we talking about biolabs on the 23rd of, 24th of February? Well, it actually doesn't make sense. You know what? Maybe it actually will on the 16th of March, right? So just cutting things out, um, I would be very wary of just as a kind of one small answer to that strategic amplification question. There's a few in the a few in the um, chat, so I'll try to answer those. Um, yeah, so thanks very much, um, Kat, around the UN question. And I think you know it's a it's a challenging one, and I say it's a challenging one because um, I used to work for the the government of Canada in in public affairs, and uh, more or less, and um, nation states and supranational organizations are situated in an interesting place about, you know, um, 
their stories coming from the top. And when their stories don't come from the top, um, that can be viewed as deceptive, right? At the same time, building capacity um, to allow people, so this is media literacy, information literacy, building capacity is probably, I would say, a pretty good place to start. Um, I would not say that just providing the truth is a great place to start. I can see that, um, you know, in the poor, the poor U.S. Embassy um, in 2020, you know, saying like, oh, I'll tell you what these bio labs are for. It's just totally, you know, um, innocuous, right? And that <laughs> both, we both kind of catches the phrase. But um, yeah, so I think I'd answer it that way. What do you see as a role of the UN helping to stop the spread of the information? Um, I think so. I th uh, yeah, I think that's a that's just a double up. So maybe I've answered that. Um, is there a, is there a follow up you want to skewer me on, Cat, with that one? No, no, sorry. I just accidentally sent you that question to your double. private. Oh, to myself. I, I just wanted that. the group to say that the question was about what role. <laughs> I'm being controlled by that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Any other questions that I've missed? I really am sorry if I haven't seen them. Um, I'm in information overload with uh, between the chat and the mentee. So. The truth is relative and to whom and to whom read it in a person's background. What do you think about early education contribution to educating the reader to read and respond critically to today's news? So there's a really interesting, I wouldn't, I mean, it's, it's tough to say, right? I don't, so I'm not quite sure I go as far as saying the truth is relative. Um, there are truths out there that people abide by and live their lives by. And there's different ways we can explain this by saying there's two types of truth. One is the kind of like physics that holds buildings up. And then, then two is, you know, um, the, the internal truths people have to go on those buildings and, and worship there, right? Or believe whatever it is they believe that building is, is, is for, um, just as the kind of like dichotomy. But what I was gonna say is there's this kind of really interesting moment um, around objectivity and public discourse that kind of happens, you know, fr from kind of from World War I on, like after World War I, and that there's an expectation that like there is objective news and like we're going to report the facts and this is the world and I just, you know, I just report it. Um, and that's a really odd blip in history, right? even during the enlightenment and all this and and you know as as britain was was considering its 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 um constitutional democracy and its parliament and how that came to be like news was really partisan right information was like really political and and there's been this blip that you know we, we think and, and it's it's and it is an american thing uh, that there's objective news and that's kind of this incredible manifestation, this incredible idea um, that, that that's time might have passed. There was a strange blip there. And, and yeah, so I think realizing that maybe, um, it's, I, I don't know how early to go on the early, early education, but I think, but I think it, I think it's, um, I think those skills need to be there because I mean, the, you know, the, the stories our, our, our children come home with from their friends about you know, what movies they're able to watch or what games they're able to play or the experiences they've had you know, um, from a very early age are exaggerated and they're misinformation. And they're misinformation so they can you know, go do their own things. But I think the, the kind of critical response to today's news, whether it be from your teacher, your classmate, CNN or Russia Today, um, yeah, is, is an essential part of living in our in our age when, when information can spread so quickly um, from yeah, an early age. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that to me goes back to the design question, right? Um, social media are designed to keep you there. That's the, that's the product um, and, to, and to polarize various issues via your attention. It's not about being critical of the internet, it's about building a better one. Right, that's the that's the dawn of the view, um, and I think that's that's actually the question. You can't be critical of you know uh, uh, <laughs> a platform fire, right? Um, you have to you actually have to build a better one. 
Well, I think we've I think we've lost half the half the audience. So that that probably is a, a signal in itself that my my information is now missed or misinforming um, the rest. Have so, to do. Uh, it's, yeah, it's right. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm happy to sign off. But if anyone's um, wanting to chat for a bit more, then, what, I, then I'm happy to do that as well. What we might do is we might um, collate any questions that you haven't answered just because of that scrolling mechanism, and maybe we yep. can put a blog post on the library blog. Um, we can send them to you and you can respond in writing and we can add well, that to the library blog. Thank you, because there's heaps of questions. And we, as you said, we've gone we've gone on that uh, for a long time. So that's that's great. And I'll I'll um endeavor to be much more eloquent in, in writing than I than I am uh, today. All right. Thanks very much again, Luke, and thanks everyone for, for coming. I hope you learned as much as I did. Thank you so much.